Hello, I'm Mukhar Rizvi, and this is Scope. We're going to start off today's show by discussing Russia-U.S. relations. We have President Biden now in office, a very different president from President Donald Trump, who at least the perception of him was that he was a very pro-Putin, pro-Russia president in the White House. President Biden has, from day one, essentially sought to distance himself for, from that position of Donald Trump and that narrative of Donald Trump. And now he is on a trip to Europe, as we know, for the G7 summit. Uh, he will be meeting President President Putin um, pretty soon, in fact, in Belgium as well. And that meeting is meant to be a tense one because there are many issues that the two sides disagree upon. We can talk about Ukraine and a whole host of other issues, such as um, the rights of opposition leaders, such as Navalny and others within Russia as well. Let's put those issues now to our guests who are joining us. We're joined up by Miro Papadze, who is a fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. He's joining us this morning from Washington, D.C. Joining us from Moscow is Dr. Karl Roman Gasanov, who is a senior fellow at the Russian People's Friendship University, EU, Middle East. Kamran and Miro, thank you both for your time today. Uh, Miro, let me start with you. Um, what do you think the goal of President Biden will be in his meeting with President Putin? Um, will he be uh, very confrontational, or do you think that, in fact, he's looking for a more of a reset, if I may use that term, with relations with Russia? Uh, uh, thank you very much for having me, first of all, and um, uh, it's a very good question, but we need to go a little back and uh, see if, uh, when we are talking about the reset. Every president after the fall of the Soviet Union really tried to reset the relationship with Russia. We all remember Clinton and uh, Eltsin's very close relationship. We all remember how Bush, uh, President Bush, saw uh, Putin's soul in his eyes. Uh, we also remember uh, Obama's the famous reset policy, and we also remember um, we remember Trump's very cozy relationship with uh, Mr. Putin, but. Uh, unlike his predecessors, uh, Joe Biden already showed that uh, he is not going to have a reset with Russia. Ever since he came to power, we need to remember that uh, he really regarded uh, Putin as a killer, and he imposed actually number of sanctions for um, on Russia for Putin's misbehavior. For example, uh, for example, um, uh, Putin. Ex uh, Putin imposed the sanctions on Russia for putting bounty on uh, uh, on U.S. soldiers fighting in Afghanistan. He, he imposed sanctions on uh, Russia for uh, for poisoning, for imprisoning and mistreating uh, Russian famous um, uh, political opposition leader Alexander Navalny. Uh, Biden also imposed sanctions on uh, Russia for uh, for cyber attacks. Uh, mm. uh, this uh, infamous solar uh, solar wind. And uh, hacks on uh, American federal agencies and uh, federal agents and private companies, and also for his intervention. Yeah, intervention. But we also, but we also saw last uh, month that the United States and uh, and Russia they see that that uh, there are some issues uh, uh, where they cannot. Uh, uh, there are some issues uh, uh, that there are areas where they can work, but there are some issues where they cannot uh, uh, narrow their differences. So I think mm. Biden will will need uh, Putin's support on some issues. Okay, so tell, tell us the, the Russian perspective then. What do you think Putin's intentions vis-a-vis uh, -vis this meeting with, with um, Biden are? Is he looking for a reset in relations? I think, uh, of course, Russia also uh, seeking, uh, is seeking a uh, restart of relations with the United States, States, even if the expectations are not so high, are not so optimistic. But nevertheless, we understand that we speak about two great powers, and the conflict between Moscow and Washington uh, will bring nowhere. And the same thing uh, already told uh, Biden. He said that. We should uh, keep our relations uh, stable and speak about global security. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will bring to conflict, and uh, the United States, as well as Russia, uh, are not interested in an open conflict uh, because we have. Uh, I understand that we have some uh, contradictions uh, in Syria in human rights issues and so on, but. Nevertheless, we have uh, global security, the INF Treaty, uh, which we already prolonged, and uh, other treaties uh, which we 
this still uh, to prolong and to revive. And without this treaty, the global security will collapse. And uh, also the allies of the United States in Europe and the allies of Russia, they will be happy with it. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, there is some chance uh, to uh, move our relations uh, a little, uh, to, to make them a little bit warmer. And, and uh, already uh, Biden, uh, he uh, stopped sanctions against uh, Nord Stream 2. And this is a good sign for, for us because uh, in, the time, in the time of Trump, uh, uh, which was shown, we had this uh, sanction, but now no more. And uh, of course, Ukraine. Uh, in Ukraine, this conflict is also dangerous. In February, we were very close to war, and we understand that uh, if Ukraine starts war in Donbass, Russia, Russia will involve, and the United States uh, should also do something, and it's also dangerous. Mm. Right, Cyril, um, what should we expect to then come out of this meeting? We already have sanctions on Russia. Um, the Russians also have tit-for-tat sanctions to an extent on the Americans. Uh, we all know the issues that they disagree on. Uh, can they actually figure out compromises on the issues that they disagree on? So, for example, Ukraine is a huge one. Uh, can we ever see light at the end of that tunnel? Uh, um, this is um, uh, this is summit. I think where we should not expect uh, big deliverables because these, these countries are strategic uh, rivals, uh, the strategic rivals and competitors. But this relationship did, uh, started like in 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia and uh, continues its aggression in Georgia. 20 percent of Georgia's territory is still occupied, and Russia is uh, continuing this aggression. Russia also uh, annexed Crimea in 2014 and continues its aggression in eastern Ukraine. Donbas, for example, as my friend just mentioned, is de facto controlled by Putin. So these are the, these are the areas where they cannot find their solutions. Where the, but there are some areas where they can narrow differences. There are some areas where their interests intersect and overlap. For example, Afghanistan. United States is pulling out from Afghanistan, and also it is interested in stable and secure in Afghanistan. But this will be more headache for Russia, because it, it's close to Russian Federation, and it borders Russia's strategic partners and allies, such as, for example, uh, Tajikistan. And any uh, security threat emanating from Afghanistan will require, re require Russia's financial, military, and uh, political um, uh, capital. But um, there are also some areas so they, where they can cooperate, for example, North Koreans uh, uh, nuclear ambitions. We are also Iran, because we all know that the United States is seriously considering to uh, go back to the GCPOA agreement, and uh, and and uh, Biden will need. Uh, uh, Russia on board, and also there is another issue such as uh, climate change, where both countries uh, share some interest. So we can see some some cooperation, but in the long term, they will remain rivals and adversaries. But from the Russian perspective, I think Putin is more interested uh, on process than the derivables and the substance, because um, uh, uh, his uh, popularity at home is at an all-time low. His mm. political party, his ratings are very down. He's been criticized for Alexander Navalny. He's been criticized for mismanagement of uh, mismanagement of uh, COVID-19. So mm. he needs some victories and to gain some legitimacy before the elections in, in the fall. So I think he will want to show himself as a global leader, stand up against the United States and as a defender of traditional orthodox values and, and principles. So this is for Putin a little victory, just uh, the, the process of the meeting. Kamran, uh, it's hard to disagree with, with Miro on that point, right? I mean, Putin does seem like he is in a weak position right now or a weaker position than he has been in the past because of the pandemic uh, and for other such reasons as well, even when it comes to internationally speaking as well, when it comes to Navalny and human rights situations and democratic ideals within Russia. Um, do you think then Putin needs to gain something from this meeting more than even Biden? I think the same is true about Biden, but that uh, because uh, the situation of pandemic in the United States is worse than in Russia, 
it was Russia has uh, the first uh, vaccine and already uh, sold this uh, to 70 countries. Uh, as for Navalny, I think that uh, Putin uh, doesn't expect uh, anything from Biden. This question is already closed for him. Uh, there could be no compromise in this case because, because it is the case and the uh, internal affairs of Russian Federation. And uh, I think that Putin doesn't expect anything from Biden. Maybe uh, only he could expect that Biden will not uh, touch this question, but it, it is impossible. Uh, and by Biden already said that I will write uh, the question of human rights. Uh, and he must do this because he is the leader of democracy. Uh, world, uh, the leader of West, and he must uh, bring to uh, this question. Uh, but at the same time, I think that um, the meaning of this meeting is that uh, the, these two leaders, which uh, uh, maybe hate themselves, uh, hate each other, uh, they understand that they have responsibility. Uh, in front of other world, and if uh, they don't speak, uh, they, this could be worse. The meeting is for, for meeting, I think, that they should meet, uh, should speak, and to keep uh, somehow their relations, uh, conversation, and not to lose uh, everything, uh, because they have, as our expert already mentioned, they still have uh, some areas where they can cooperate. I would add also here Palestine, because the positions of Russia and the United States in Palestine, and this is the position of two states. Uh, this is the same, and also in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, Biden already told that uh, we need Russia to stabilize Afghanistan. And some other uh, questions, maybe also Libya, uh, we can find a common language. Hmm. It's a very good point, isn't it, Miro? Because Afghanistan is obviously extremely important for the Americans. It's been the longest war that the Americans have fought in recent memory. And um, they really want to get out for obvious reasons, because it seems that the American people are not in favor of just remaining in these forever wars. Um, is that an area of cooperation? Can the two sides cooperate, c considering their respective histories when it comes to Afghanistan? Sure. Uh, as I said, um, uh, when uh, uh, Blinken, uh, when Blinken and Mr. Lauro met each other uh, a month ago, they uh, identified Afghanistan as a point of potential cooperation, because as I mentioned, uh, Afghanistan is a very significant issue for United States, but also for Russia, because the United States also is interested uh, in uh, seeing uh, successful uh, Afghanistan after so many years of uh, being there and investing in. In, in building Afghanistan state, but also it, uh, given the fact that Afghanistan is uh, close to the uh, close to Russia and Russia has its uh, interest in uh, Afghanistan, I think uh, Russia and uh, United States will cooperate, and especially for security reasons, as I uh, as I mentioned, because uh, uh, it will any any problems, any significant challenges, terrorist challenge, terrorism, or some other extremist movements emanating from Afghanistan. It will have different. Uh, it will have direct, uh, um, uh, direct impact on Russia, and I think it will. Um, it will require more Russian involvement, and I think this is a. This will be a bigger headache for Russia than the United States as we move forward. Very well. The clock has gotten the best. We really appreciate both Miro and Kamran for taking their time out to discuss uh, Russia-U.S. relations as we have in the past with them as well. We will keep a very close eye, certainly, on what this meeting um, brings about. Uh, we shouldn't, as Miro there correctly pointed out, we shouldn't expect anything major to come out of this vis-a-vis, -vis, um, you know, the two sides reaching some, some massive understanding and working through the many issues that they disagree on. Nevertheless, we may be able to see certain uh, agreements on issues of mutual interests, as we just mentioned there at the end of Afghanistan as well. I'll be back with my next segment after this break.
Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wakar Vizu. Now, in this segment, we're going to talk about Myanmar. A lot has been happening in that country. We can talk about certainly how many, many mass deaths are happening in that country, according to the United Nations. We also have reports of, of school children under pressure. Aung San Suu Kyi is obviously on trial, and the charges against her keep piling up vis-a-vis uh, -vis corruption, I believe, is the latest one at this point in time. Uh, it, it seems that this coup um, and the junta keep ensuring that their power remains ever stronger in that country. And I'm going to put those points now to our guest who is joining us today from Kuala Lumpur. We're joined by Dr. Bridget, Bridget Welsh, who is a senior research associate at the Center for East Asia Democratic Studies of the National Taiwan University. Uh, Bridget, thank you very much for joining us uh, here in Scope today. Uh, let's, let's start, Bridget, with just the main issue of the coup itself and what's happened ever since. Um, it seems that you know any hope of the coup collapsing, and as in with the people being able to overthrow this move, is that pretty much diminished at this point? We're now four months in, and I think that what we've seen is the the civil defense movement and responses have evolved over time, uh, and I think that they have become more confrontational, uh, with more attacks on military facilities as civil war has really kind of extended through parts of the city. They operate more kind of uh, sneak attacks. Um, I think that uh, while the military has, as you've rightly pointed out, taken more physical control over the over the territory, it hasn't yet managed to take um, control over the hearts and minds of the people of Myanmar, who are still in the overwhelming majority opposed to it. And we've also seen a widening of the fighting. There are five states in the country that have very significant mass fighting happening, with, a, with over 200,000 people displaced, 100,000 are estimated in the Karini state that are facing urgent humanitarian needs. So in a sense that the military hasn't taken full control over the country, and, and it definitely hasn't taken the support uh, from from uh, the Myanmar people, the majority of the Myanmar people. And of course, in many places, it also lacks international recognition because it is not the legitimate uh, 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 people in charge of the country. Where, where have things gone wrong that on the part of the international community? Do you think that um, there was sort of this, this, when there was easing of pressure on Myanmar while Aung San Suu Kyi was still very much in office and was when still in a fairly leadership position if I know I know I'm going to use that term loosely because I know that the junta was still a huge presence at that time um, do you think that it's the fact that we all became very relaxed towards Myanmar in the sense that we thought okay now it's on the right path so um, we saw, sort of all step back and we were all caught uh, off guard well, I think the fact is is that anybody who studied the history of Burma and uh, subsequent Myanmar knows that the military has a history of coming back into power. Um, I think that you know one of the challenges is is that the uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's government uh, really always saw their their contenders for power as the as the military, which is one of the reasons that they uh, responded atrociously to the Rohingya uh, genocide that took place. Uh, but I think the international community really has never had adequate understanding and outreach of, to the military itself. And I think one of the things that uh, is pretty clear is that the military has a very different way of conceptualizing what they think is the national interests. Many of them feel that they're doing the right thing by taking power. And so I think there was clearly an underestimation of the, underestimate of the situation and this, the thinking within the military itself. Um, I also think that uh, the NLD as a, as a government, besides the problem of the Rohingya, that serious problem with the Rohingya that I've mentioned, there were also serious gaps in terms of governance that, uh, in terms of the economy, uh, that uh, that I think really um, helped to weaken some of the legitimacy. Uh, uh, you know, it still faced considerable poverty. And as a consequence, uh, the, the outreach to some sections of the population might not have been as strong. So it's not so much that the international community underestimated the, the dynamics or misunderstood. There were some elements of that. But I would also say say that there was a situation where um, the Myanmar could have gotten more international support uh, for kind of strengthening its, po its economy and addressing some of the serious issues and humanitarian issues that it inherited when the military came, military stepped back from power as it did in, in 20, from 2015. 
Okay, so let's talk about the pressure that the international community has attempted to bring on uh, to the to, to the Miri's junta, right? So we've had talk of um, bringing them under pressure, economic pressure, that is, even as individuals who are part of that junta, uh, through the many interests that they have, economic interests that they have, the, the companies that they are a part of. Um, has that succeeded to any extent? I mean, do you think that that has been a successful campaign in trying to target the, the junta more directly through those economic interests that they have? Have? So economic sanctions uh, have taken sort of two different manifestations. One, they've been targeted against the leaders themselves. And I think uh, these targeted sanctions have probably had not as much effect because they have already put money of their funds and their investments in different places that, that don't necessarily um, have the same sort of targeting process. In terms of the businesses, this is where the, the impact is really growing. And we do see um, that the uh, businesses that are considering to leave the country are actually fundamentally um, shifting the dynamic for, for the society. And I think that it's too early to see what the long-term implications are going to be. Uh, but I do think that uh, uh, there have been pressures from the oil sector to the telecommunications sector, um, which really have suggested to, to Myanmar that it is uh, uh, Tatmada, that it is a very different situation now. Um, and my expectations is that these efforts will grow. Um, but I think your larger point is on a very important one, is is pressure the, um, on the military the, a, a, a critical strategy that is going to be successful from the international community? And I think it has to be part of a repertoire of a whole series of strategies uh, that really uh, uh, um, kind of show that the military, that it actually needs needs to step back from power, that it's not in the interest of the country, um, given what's happening in terms of the humanitarian cost, but the economic cost. Um, and I think that uh, as this time uh, moves on, we're going to see um, you know, some of the pressures happening within the military itself. And keep in mind that the military stepped back from power as a result of divisions within it. And I think this is going to be a very important thing to watch as we look forward. Hmm. Uh, one interesting aspect, and you correct me if I'm wrong, maybe maybe I'm overstating this, Bridget, is that right when the right when the coup happened, a lot of those who came out uh, in the in the diaspora, I would say, and even I think within the country, who were who were protesting the coup, uh, they were put on the spot then about their views on the Rohingya as well, right? And some of them had been, I don't know if the word is anti-Rohingya, but were not as supportive of Rohingya rights uh, when that was at its peak, or at least in the international media uh, as we understand it. Um, do you think that there has been then almost a reckoning of sorts that even for those who now speak up for general human rights, I'm saying within Myanmar and democratic rights, that they have realized that maybe that was a misstep, that they should have stood up for the Rohingya and that they now will? I think um, there have been very positive steps among many um, that to recognize some of the, and acknowledge the mistakes of not speaking out and acting out uh, on these issues when they happened. I think that, that what is the most illustrative of that is the national unity government, the alternative government that's been formed, um, and how they have taken a position on issues of the Rohingya. That said, I think that you know uh, there are two important caveats. Uh, number one, uh, there have and some reservations continue to be expressed by Rohingya community of the fact that there is not necessarily adequate, um, some adequate citizenship issues that are being fully um, acknowledged within that, that they're acknowledging them, but it doesn't necessarily clearly go as far as many would people would like. Uh, and in particular, in that element is to also deal with some of the, the justice issues of what happened in the past. Um, the, and, and these are things I think that are going to be very important, important longer term. No. The second dimension of that, and it is, is that it, talk is different than walk, and we don't necessarily, you know, people are making the statements, um, but we also need to see what sort of um, credible actions are taken, and, it, and we have to keep in mind that the conditions that the many, the most of the Rohingyas are living in, in the camps in Bangladesh, mm. are still abhorrent. Um, they are facing tremendous hardship, and I think that there's a lot more that can be done to address the needs of this community, um, and I think it, it needs to go well beyond um, having uh, recognition, but also dealing with some of the uh, addressing the needs of that community now.
Very well, we'll leave it there at that, but we really appreciate you putting this all into context for us, giving us an overview about the latest when it comes to Myanmar. We were discussing there with, with Bridget. Um, the issue, of course, of the coup, which is still very much the root issue, at least for what's happening right now in Myanmar. Uh, then the major issue for the international community, for the rest of us, is Rohingya as well and their rights. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, um, her corruption trial, as well as the, the mass deaths that we're hearing about. There are several issues at play here, as well as then the international pressure or lack of uh, on the military junta, as well as its economic interests, which we've been told time and again, even in this show, that that is key, seemingly, to, to hold the military junta to account and possibly to, to help it reverse its decision towards proper than democratic ideals in the country. I'll be back with my final segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wilkar Rizvi. Now, in this step, we're going to discuss um, that Islamophobic terror attack that took place in London, Ontario, in Canada. Uh, a family was essentially overrun by uh, a car. Um, and as they were out for a walk and they were targeted specifically according to police um, and the intelligence that came out because um, they were of the Muslim faith and in fact there even um, is intelligence to talk of the fact that this terrorist wanted to actually go on and attack the London mosque as well or one of the mosques uh, in London Ontario also now there has been since that um, an outpouring of, of condemnation on the part of many Canadian politicians even those in fact who have voted against Islamophobia motions within the, the Parliament and the Canadian Senate. And so there is a lot of, um, so to speak, hypocrisy to go around as well when it comes to Canadian politicians and their reactions uh, to what has happened, unfortunately, in this tragic incident on this Muslim family. Let's discuss all of that a bit further. We're firstly joined by Stephen Zhu, who is an investigative journalist. He's joining us this morning from Toronto. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, just as, as an initial reaction, Stephen, what were your thoughts about this happening? Because, uh, you know, after the last time around when we had a terror attack on Muslims as well, uh, Trudeau had come out, Prime Minister Trudeau had come out and labeled that terrorism as well, as he has this time. But that doesn't seem to necessarily discourage this sort of thing from happening again. No, I think, um, I think like most people, I approached um, the news with a lot of shock initially, but uh, once the emotions wear off a bit um, and we're able to take a step back, you take a look at the hate crime numbers, you take a look at how um, since the uh, Quebec City mosque shooting in 2017, how anti-Muslim uh, hatred of incidents have gone up uh, in 2017 and haven't really tapered off since then. Um, I think there's there's more alertness among the Canadian public about how now they're the two worst uh, anti-Muslim incidents, uh, mass murders are both, uh, you know, out of North America are both in Canada, and I think that that has also um, translated a bit into the the halls of power, and we see the the Conservative Party. Um, come out and use the term Islamophobia, which they um, objected to in the two, 2017 motion 103, which uh, was a motion they all voted against, uh, and and you know was supposed to condemn Islamophobia. Yeah. So I'm at this point, then. Um even within, uh, you know, the, the many of the politicians, there has still been controversy, right, on the part of uh, experts who have come out and said, listen, this is, this is a one-off incident. There's already been talk, as you know, Stephen, and this happens regularly in such incidences about the mental health of, of uh, the terrorist here. Um, what do you make of those specific reactions? I mean, there, there are those who are downplaying um, if or not this shows Islamophobia within Canadian society and B, about the mental health of, of the terrorists who carried this out. Well, you know, first and foremost, uh, the information about this uh, suspect is thin, relatively speaking, because uh, for whatever reason, we can go into his background if you want, but his uh, his online profile is is very very thin. It's as it's almost as if you know he or you know whoever else went in there and scrubbed everything, um, all the interactions on social media and so on and so forth. There's no he didn't leave any manifestos or anything to indicate uh, online at least exactly why he did this or if there are any ideological things that he was consuming 
or if there was any, you know, ideologically um, uh, sort of like motivated media he was uh, he was consuming. So I think the reporters right now are generally reporting whatever uh, they're being told um, by the sources that they've been able to gather. Uh, I think they're doing their best, and I and the the picture that emerges is. A, a young man who has severe issues uh, psychologically. I think that, I mean, it just is part of the picture. Whether or not, you know, uh, that has been taken by certain far right voices in Canada um, to, to say, oh, look, this, uh, this, this thing was, was, was purely uh, an aberration based on um, uh, mental illness, uh, that's another question. And there has been a lot of that, a lot of, um, sort of attempts to, uh, after the event to whitewash this whole thing and to downplay, like you said, um, hatred. Um, I'm going to refer to the polls here, uh, Stephen. I know polls are not always uh, reliable, and, and this, these are quite a few years old now, so this doesn't necessarily mean this is present case to this extent. Hopefully, uh, things have co probably gotten better, I hope. But in 2016, there was a poll that revealed that 41% of Canadian adults had some level of bias against identifiable racial, identifiable, pardon me, racial groups such as Muslims, who had the n highest negative rating at 28% back then. Um, and we've also had you know, hate crimes against Muslims in Canada increased around 253%, according to one study between 2012 and 2015. Now, as I said, these are quite a few years old, and I'm sure there are more um, polls that have been done in these middle years. But why is the tide going that way? What, what's changed recently? Is it um, the rise of uh, the, the right in, sen in the sense that we, this is sort of carrying over from the border uh, from America? No, I don't think you really can say that this is, you know, a bug that Canada caught out of nowhere from the Americans or Donald Trump or anything like that. Um, those numbers, those opinion polls um, about antipathy towards Muslims in Canada uh, are relative, have relatively been pretty consistent um, since 9-11. Uh, and so that's not necessarily new, but what is new, I think, in the past five or six years is that Canada, you know, is a multicultural uh, country, like many Western countries are, you know, in, in this age of um, rapid globalization, uh, are dealing with multiple uh, ethnicities, religions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for, for a long time now. And um, there are nativist elements within that mixture um, who don't want or don't like uh, this reality, uh, be it the economic, you know, there are certain economic repercussions and uh, of globalization and so on and so forth, and that's all being brought up. But um, you know, similar to the United States, similar to parts of Western Europe, part of that, the reaction uh, to this new era we're we're living in, um, is a nativist and populist one that um, politicians, you know, using their respectable platforms, have tried to. You know, sometimes smuggle in hmm. to um, uh, poles of power, and um, that has had that has contributed to a climate of Islamophobia in Canada. Okay, we're now joined by Mustafa Farouk, who is a lawyer, but he's also, and most importantly, the CEO of the National Council of Canadian Muslims, known by its abbreviation NCCM. He's joining us this morning from Ottawa, Ontario, in Canada. Mustafa, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, obviously, I wanted to get your, a, your reaction to what occurred in, in London, Ontario, Mustafa. And secondly, I know that NCCM has been, has been calling for a few very specific steps for the Canadian government to be taking. Can you please elaborate on that as well for us? Sure. I mean, obviously, I think we're all on the same page as to where we're, what we're all feeling about uh, what happened in the London terror attack. Uh, I mean, it's beyond devastating. And I mean, it, just, it is, I mean, it, I, don't know, I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, yeah. In terms of the, uh, the, the thing that we've asked for from the federal government, we, uh, joining with the London Muslim Mosque called for um, the federal government to host a national action summit on Islamophobia that brings together the provinces, uh, the territories and the municipalities because we need a cross-jurisdictional approach to bring in immediate change within the next six few months to solving this issue around violent Islamophobia and to begin to address some of the systemic issues of Islamophobia in this country. 
Well, uh, if, if I may just be very blunt, Mustafa, do you think a summit in and of itself will resolve the issue? Because I mean, um, at least looking from the uh, from the outside, and of course, and you know, you know better because you're on the ground. But one would think that after what has happened in Quebec, for example, when it comes to the the, the bill that was passed regarding religious symbols and the right to wear that or the lack of, in fact, in certain public positions, as well as the way that the vote had gone with gone with M103, that bill as well. Um, will a summit in and of itself resolve that issue? No. Uh, the summit is and the policies that uh, will be developed and publicly released after the summit will be the, the uh, way by which to test whether those in government at the federal, provincial, and municipal levels who stood at the vigil and said that they stood with the Muslim community and are were willing to figure out the solutions. The policies and recommendations that come out of that will be the barometer by which Canadians uh, can assess whether their leaders are serious about actually solving the problems in front of them. Okay, so now I want to bring you back in and ask you then, what are, what are your thoughts about the next steps that need to happen, right? Because um, the talk is nice. I mean, it's, it's nice to have even Aaron O'Toole, who is the conservative leader, to come out and, as you said in your first answer, uh, speak about the fact this is a terror attack, use that word as well. But what actions need to be taken, in, in your opinion? Well, actually, you know, you know, um, what positive steps could be taken, um, you know, under the leadership of organizations of NCCM? That's a more complicated issue of, you know, how do you go about solving this with, um, you know, a ten-point plan or an agenda or something like that? I think that's a very complex social uh, issue. But what we know, um, just in the in the past few years, is that, particularly with the pandemic. Uh, politicians across the board, you know, it's not the majority or anything, but there have been voices or a tendency at least from certain political parties and so forth um, to play to the, the populist rhetoric again that somehow, uh, you know, Islam is a, is a problem or pushing conspiracy theories, racist conspiracy theories, anti-Semitic ones about how, you know, the Jews and, and the, the Muslims are you know, somehow behind uh, disastrous events or, or agendas to overthrow Canadian uh, liberties and so on and so forth. It's not that the our leaders are are repeating this kind of uh, garbage word for word, but there have been tendencies. Uh, for example, with the M103 situation, the, that motion in 2017, where. Uh, echoes of those sentiments are sometimes affirmed a bit too much within uh, political circles. Um, that, you know, since 2017, that issue hasn't really been uh, properly addressed, and it really took another mass murder for because the leader leadership of the conservatives to come out and even use the term Islamophobia, which is a term they rejected in 2017. Most there is a danger, is there not, and I'm sure you appreciate this, that, that for now we have this attention, the spotlight on this issue because of, unfortunately, this, this terror attack, but that this may very well dissipate uh, in the not foreseeable near future because that's just how, unfortunately, the news cycle works. Um, what then happens then once, once we, unfortunately, have stopped talking about this? That's really the key time, isn't it? So, I mean, I think the reality is that I guess there's two realities. One reality is that, you know, unfortunately, until we make change, Allah, may God protect every human being, but things, bad things are happening. And this problem is not going away unless we make it go away. Uh, I mean, just, I mean, like we've seen in the aftermath and, and Stephen has been at the forefront of covering some of these things. Uh, we've seen, you know, Canadians celebrating what happened um, in London. Uh, we've seen, you know, just outside of my office, like a block away yesterday, uh, you know, a woman beat to a couple that was speaking Arabic to each other. Uh, these things are not going away. Um, and we need to, as a society, change these things to make them go away. So this problem is not one that's disappearing. We just, early, you know, a few months ago, had someone walk outside of Quebec's uh, a mosque in Montreal, take an air gun and fire at the windows. And just a few months prior to that, 
uh, we had the killing at the IMO mosque in Detobico. I think I was on your show then as well. These problems are not going away. And so we need action to stop it. Um, and I'll also say this. We, as the Canadian Muslim community, are not going to be standing and waiting on a news cycle. Uh, we're not going to be waiting for when attention diminishes. As long as there are problems that impact the safety and security, not just of Canadian Muslims, but of all Canadians, we will not stop standing and we will not stop working to protect communities. And I'll give you the final word before I let both of you go. Um, let's talk about political momentum then. Do you think that the, the political courage then exists um, even on Trudeau's part? I mean, you know, as I said, he's he's spoken a lot and he's even, you know, had better outreach, certainly, of course, than, than Harper. I mean, uh, without doubt, to the Muslim community as well as other minority communities across the country. But do you think that he has the political courage to act uh, in a very substantive way? Oh, I don't think I have the confidence to, to say that that um, he he does. But I think um, you know, I mean, I just think think the, the history proves otherwise. But uh, is there an opening? There's certainly an opening. Um, it, you know, it's easy for for the, the the leadership of this country to come out in a in a time like this and say all the right things. Uh, the Prime Minister Trudeau has said a lot of uh, good things. And you know he's he's consistently done so, and he deserves credit for doing so. But um, you know we have uh, Canada has a judicial system where, for example, the the 2017 uh, mass murderer uh, who, who killed those people in Quebec City mosque um, served concurrent sentences. For example, it, it was called a six for one deal. Um, they serve the time for one charge um, uh, despite uh, being charged for six uh, murders. Those, those kinds of things, you know, you're starting to hear more people talk about changing that, but that's a very systemic kind of change that, um, you know, is going to take a lot of political will uh, to, to do. And, you know, the idea is that if you do change it, you make the punishments more severe, you make the rules tighter and so on and so forth, you get tougher, that um, these uh, these things start happening less and less. And, uh, you know, it, it may or may not be the case, but I think it's uh, there is there is an opening to, to do so. Very well, leave there at that, uh, but we really appreciate what Stephen and Mustafa for taking their time out this morning. I know they have extremely busy schedules, especially these days in the light of this terror attack. So we appreciate the context they brought to the discussion. Um, you know, as a Canadian myself too, it is disturbing, as Mustafa there said, that, the, that there are fellow Canadians who have in fact celebrated this latest terror attack as they have previous ones as well against Muslims. And again, he listed them out for us, as did Stephen as well. Um, disturbing, yes. Um, Politicians have this time around come out in stronger terms than past times, as in we've even had conservatives call this a terror attack um, and said that there needs to be action against Islamophobia. Will there be follow-up? That's the real key issue here, that there needs to be follow-up to ensure that this does not ever happen again. Um, a, against the Muslim community or any minority community of faith or ethnicity otherwise. I'll leave it there for now. I've been Okar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.